Um, so uh, I'm just really honored that you would ask me to speak to you. And I'm really, really honored to be able to speak on this subject, which is a subject that you're going to find odd. And that is the parable of the latrine or toilet, if you will. And understand that for some of you, that's just almost over the top. But hear me out, because what you're going to discover is that there actually is a parable of the toilet in the Bible, and it's a very powerful parable, and it's one that we've normally uh, not seen. It's one that we've neglected. In fact, it doesn't make the parable list of most of our uh, commentaries or even you, you know your study Bibles that'll have a list of parables. But I want you to see it is real. It's actually in the Bible, and it really does have a powerful message for us. It's really, again, it's just really good to be with you. Uh, with you, I'm um, a little heavy hearted that we can't do it in person. I can't spend time with you. But uh, we're thankful for the technology, and uh, I'm constantly reminded of what the church must have experienced in days of persecution when they were unable to get together and they did not have the technology, and uh, how, um, how painful and sometimes lonely and even frightening that must have been. So thanks for having me. I just want to start by um, just sort of telling a, a, a quick story uh, that I heard Landon Saunders once tell. This was many, many years ago that I heard him say this 30 years ago, maybe more. He uh, explains that he used to go scuba diving in some of the lakes in Arkansas. I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, he grew up in Arkansas. And uh, he and his friends would sometimes go out and they would throw uh, something into the water and then they would scuba dive down and see who could get it in, in, in a lake or a river or something. He said on one occasion, uh, they were down uh, looking for whatever they had thrown down when he said he noticed under the water that there was a sunken coca-cola can and something moving inside of it so he he brought the can up and they set it on the um on the deck there to see what it was and they noticed that there was a catfish inside the cola can and the catfish he said was too big to fit through the hole so they figured out what must have happened the catfish must have swam into the cola can probably looking for safety and security. But then as it grew, what was originally its house, its safe place, had become its prison. And now it was too large to get out. And it was probably only uh, a short period away from death. And when he told the story, um, you know, I immediately thought of this, how that oftentimes the traditions, the institutions, the uh, ceremonies and procedures and methodologies that we use can provide for us sometimes safety or a common way of speaking or a direct route to some objective that we have. But over a period of time, they can lose their effectiveness and actually become prisons, and in some cases, even death traps. That's the negative power of traditionalism. I want to talk a little bit about traditions and traditionalism as we look at Mark the seventh chapter, and I'll show you the parable of the latrine there in just a few moments. But let me start out by just defining a term or two. I'm going to talk about traditions and traditionalism. When I say tradition, all I mean, and in fact, the Latin term from which we get our word tradition simply means this, something that's handed down. The idea of a tradition is a neutral idea. That is, it's neither good nor bad. A tradition is just something that's handed out, and you can hand down many good things. You can also hand down many bad things. So the word tradition itself is a neutral term, either good or bad. A lot of the things that were handed down are actually very good things, very great traditions. So, for example, uh, I think Christmas is a fantastic tradition. I love it. Thanksgiving is a great tradition. Birthday parties, they're great traditions. We uh, celebrate those in my house still, and I suspect you do as well. There are traditions of how we do church. There are traditions of how we conduct ourselves uh, matters of politeness and uh, you know civility oftentimes turn out to be uh, very elaborate traditions. Just think about the tradition of shaking hands or of greeting one another. In many cases, these are very good traditions. I love them. I think you know they, they accomplish their purpose. They do it very well. But sometimes, as you know, traditions uh, often lose their effectiveness, and they can actually be. Um, they can start to work against us. So uh, a joke I heard early on, years and years ago, which uh, probably for some of us is so old that it, I don't know that it would even relate anymore, but it's a story of a, 
a man and a woman who got married and newlyweds, they had approached their first Christmas and they were getting ready to prepare the Christmas ham. I guess it's Christmas, maybe it's Easter. And the wife, who had never cooked a ham before, cut off the end of the ham and threw it away and then put the ham in the pot. Well, the man was uh, budget conscious and you know really concerned about how they spent their money. He said, well, I can throw away a perfectly good piece of meat. And she said, well, you don't, you don't cook the end of the ham. And he said, well, why not? And she said, I don't know. Mama never cooked the end of it. She always cut it off and she threw it away. So he said, well, we'll find out. So she called her mother and her mother said, well, honey, I don't know why we do that. My mom always said that. We just cut the end of the ham off and throw it away. So the new wife decided she would call grandmother. So she called up grandmother. And she said, grandmother, why is it that you cut off the end of the ham and don't cook it? And grandmother said, well, my pot's too small for the whole ham. Okay, there's a bad tradition that's handed down. A tradition that might have started for a good reason, but by the time it got to the second, third, and maybe beyond that, fourth generations, it had not only lost its effectiveness, but now it had become wasteful. It was actually working against the very thing it was established to accomplish. Now it's actually taking away food from people rather than giving food to people. So in Mark chapter 7, Jesus deals with the question of tradition. There's another word I want you to know, however, and that's the word I really want to focus on, and it's the word traditionalism. So traditionalism is not the same thing as tradition. As I said, traditions can be good or they can be bad. Traditionalism tends to be bad, tends to be a negative thing. You might can think of some cases where it's good, you know, maybe the traditionalism of the Marine Corps might be some good thing or something. But generally speaking, traditionalism is a blind allegiance to traditions, an uncritical uh, allegiance or loyalty, even when the tradition no longer affects what it was inaugurated to affect, you still cling to it. That's traditionalism. And what I want to say in this lesson is that Jesus is very clear that traditionalism will work against the Christian faith. It will stifle us, and at times it actually is contrary to the will of God. So Jesus is not against traditions, but he is against the traditions of humans when they are contrary to the word of God, and he's against traditionalism, which is the belief I should follow traditions without even thinking critically about what they were intended to accomplish. Okay, there are some definitions. We're going to come back to that in a few moments, but I just want to say again that uh, traditions and traditionalism, they really are very important issues when it comes to church. So I'm just going to say uh, for a lot of our churches, uh, we, we, we sort of fight the rock and the hard place, you know, the old phrase, between a rock and a hard place. The hard place for a lot of us is traditionalism. There are a lot of churches, including Churches of Christ in our fellowship, that are really, I think, stifled, uh, having a difficult time flourishing, um, maybe even shrinking because of a loyalty to traditions, a traditionalistic mindset that says we are going to do it the way we did it in 1950, 1932, or 1898, no matter whether it works or not. That will destroy a church. It just, stro it just strangles the life out of a church. The rock for a lot of us, if that's the hard place, the other side is some churches re react against traditionalism by going all the way in the other direction and becoming what I would call theologically progressive. That is, uh, they're, they're not even willing to accept biblical teaching if it in some way violates their uh, 21st century sentimentality. Uh, uh, progressivism is as dangerous as traditionalism, and we have to avoid both. What we want, this is what we want. We want a strict allegiance to the Word of God, but we do not want to bind anything that the Word of God does not bind and we don't want to loose anything that the Word of God does not loose. We just want to be biblical Christians. And that actually means for a lot of us having the courage to stand up against theological progressivism, which essentially says a verse can't be true if I don't want it to be true. But it also means for a lot of you, especially leaders in the church, having the courage to say, we're going to do what works if it's biblical, not what our daddies told us to do. We're going to do what the Bible tells us to do when it works. That is, um, let, me, let me reword that because that didn't sound right. What I mean to say is we're not going to be bound to a tradition that no longer works when the Word of God allows us to do it differently. That's what I want to say. So let's dive into our text, which is Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 23. And uh, I'll read sections of it for you. 
And I think it'll help us understand a little bit of what, about what's going on. And as we work through it, you'll see why I called this uh, the parable of the tree. So verse 1, Mark chapter 7. Uh, I encourage you to have a Bible with you, by the way, and open it up and look at it. So the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed hands. And then Mark gives an editorial comment to explain why this is a problem. He says in verse 3, The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So let me just stop and say what's going on. If you'll recall, the Old Testament uh, had ta taught the Jews that they were to baptize a number of different objects, including their own bodies, as part of the um, uh, process of becoming holy before God. So, for example, if your walls had mildew, you were supposed to not just wash them clean, but wash them ceremonially so that they could be, once again, holy or sacred. Uh, if you had touched a dead body, you were supposed to be baptized so that you could become holy again. There were certain kinds of uh, utensils, kitchen utensils, that you were supposed to wash in a certain way if they were defiled by touching something that was considered unclean in the Old Testament. So here's what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees did what a lot of us might have done. In fact, what they did was actually pretty reasonable in some ways. The Pharisees said, okay, look, if I'm supposed to baptize uh, a pot, if it came in contact with a dead body, let's say I'm supposed to do that. How do I know that when I was downtown doing my shopping today, I didn't accidentally touch a dead body and then accidentally touch a pot? I don't know that. So to be on the safe side, and by the way, traditions often marry that concept of the safe side. To be on the safe side, the Pharisees said, we will just wash everything all the time, and that way we'll know that we never defiled the Word of God. Sounds reasonable to me. Probably sounds reasonable to you. I mean, it's kind of a reasonable thing to do. But Jesus says, actually, it's not right, no matter how reasonable it is, because what they did was they began to baptize everything, but, and, and they condemned people who didn't. And that's where the problem arose. This is one of the fundamental problems with traditionalism. It may start for a good reason, but it inevitably leads us to condemn people who don't agree with our traditions. A tradition's a fine thing, so long as you're not using it to judge people who don't have your tradition. I'll give you a quick example. So, uh, uh, well, let's see, I want to be careful how I say this. I, hmm... I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it in a gentle way. My mama's grave is a pretty sacred place to me. And we occasionally go out and put flowers or we might uh, remember her. Uh, it's, it's out in the country. It's a beautiful graveyard, by the way, out in the middle of the hills. Well, the grave that's just behind my mom, uh, God bless them, they over-decorate theirs by my tradition. Um, lo like way, way, way over-decorate. And by the way, if you do that, that's okay. But I'm just telling you, it's so over-decorated that it's really hard for me to see my mama's grave because right next to it is a whole lot of stuff. A whole lot of stuff. Like, lots of stuff. And it took me a while to realize my tradition was no better than theirs. Their tradition of decorating for... for, for, for so, for example, at Halloween, they put scarecrows on their mother's grave and, uh, you know, pumpkin plastic pumpkins and... Uh, all kinds of stuff, you know, spooky stuff and all. And at some point it dawned on me, they don't have to follow my tradition. The problem of traditionalism is when I decide my way is the best way and I condemn everybody else. And that's what the Pharisees were doing in this text. They decided that the safe thing to do was just to go on and wash everything every day. Their problem was they started judging Jesus' disciples because they didn't have that tradition. And I just want to make sure you understand, Jesus excoriates that. When you take your tradition and use it to divide yourself from someone who is not acting unbiblically, they just don't have your tradition, Jesus has some very harsh words for you because what you're doing is dividing the body of Christ when you do that. You're not just dividing the body of Christ. You are condemning people whom God has saved. You are judging people in ways that God himself doesn't even judge them. In fact, you're inviting the judgment of God upon yourself. So it's a really serious thing that Jesus has to deal with. So here we are, verse 5, let's keep going. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? 
So they bring a charge against Jesus, and this is actually what we would consider to be a forensic uh, discourse. So Jesus replies like an attorney does. He's actually being charged with a crime. The Pharisees are literally charging with a crime because it was not just a violation of their religious laws, but remember, in Israel, you had a theocracy. So in Jesus' day, in Israel, God was also king. So a religious law was a civil law as well. So they're literally charging Jesus' disciples with a crime. They could actually be punished, go to jail for this. And so Jesus has to give a legal defense of himself. And his defense is brilliant because Jesus is brilliant. And he's brilliant because he's the son of God. He's divine. Jesus is the God of the Bible. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament. Jesus is divine. And so, of course, he gives the right answer. And I want you to see what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't try to explain what they're doing. He doesn't respond by saying, well, you know, you guys, your tradition about washing hands, let me show you a verse. He could do all that, but he doesn't. What he does is he suggests that, first of all, the Pharisees prove by their own actions that they do not have the authority to judge Jesus and his disciples. And then he even undermines them and essentially says, your laws are unconstitutional. Watch how he does it. So Jesus replies in verse 6. He quotes from the book of Isaiah. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So verses 6 and 7, Jesus declares that the uh, hand and cup and kettle and pot washing traditions of the elders are unconstitutional. They're not in the Bible. He says, these are not God-given rules. These are human rules. And you are now judging other people based on human rules. And it's a, it's a serious warning for us in the church that we don't in, uh, judge people. We don't divide along the lines of human traditions. And we'll come back to that because you might be thinking to yourself, what tradition is he thinking of? And I'll come back to it assuming we have a little time here. So first Jesus says, your, your traditions are unconstitutional. You've let go, verse 8, you've let go of the commands of God and you are holding on to human traditions. And then Jesus continues in verse 9. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your traditions. So the second thing Jesus argues, he's arguing your, your traditions are unconstitutional, they're not biblical. And second, you're hypocrites. You don't really even have the legal standing to bring an accusation because you're violating the very laws of God in order to sustain your traditions. So watch this. He says, uh, verse 10, he gives an illustration. Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to put, uh, be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares what they might have been used to help their father and mother is Corbin, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Okay, so we're going to have to unpack that for a second. What is Jesus saying? What's he talking about? So th to, there is a little bit of this text that might be lost to history. That is, there's a little bit here that we have to reconstruct, and we're not 100% sure we can fully reconstruct it. But I think this is what's happening. So the Old Testament had taught, in fact, the New Testament teaches as well, that you are to care for your parents. When your parents become elderly, it's your job to care for them. It appears that the Pharisees, uh, who in many cases were very wealthy, owned large estates. They were like Americans. They were wealthy. And, you know, we Americans tend to be wealthy. That a lot of what these Pharisees were doing was they would take their resources, their finances, their money, and they would put their money in some kind of... Um, uh, investment account and they would live off the interest so watch this my mom and dad uh, oh, my mom's deceased but my, my dad's elderly imagine if I say I'm going to take all my money and I'm going to put it in a trust fund and I'm going to pay myself out of the trust fund and then when my dad needs help I say daddy I'd like to help you but all my money's been put in a trust fund Jesus says uh, I think that's what the Pharisees were doing and they were calling their trust fund devoted to God. So maybe they were bequeathing it to the temple. Went upon their death, the temple got the money or something like this. Jesus condemns that and says, by putting your money in a trust fund, living off of it, and then refusing to care for your parents, you are nullifying the word of God. You're violating the word of God. Your tradition now actually violates the word of God. And what's fascinating is that most likely if we've reconstructed the historical background accurately, and I think this is what's going on, 
the, the truth is, setting up the money in a trust fund in order to give to the temple sounds like a good idea. It sounds like a very biblical idea. I mean, I'd like to invite you to do that for Maple Hill. Set up a trust fund when you die. Let the church have the trust fund. We've got, someone's done that for North Boulevard. We've been able to help. They left several hundred thousand dollars to North Boulevard. We've been able to help all kinds of people in charity through this trust fund. Sounds like a great idea, but Jesus says it's not a great idea. If you do that, live on the interest and refuse to care for your parents. You have violated a fundamental commandment. One of the Ten Commandments which is honoring your father and mother. So again, Jesus is inviting us to scrutinize, this is the point, scrutinize your traditions to make sure they are not leading you to violate the word of God. Okay, I hope I'm piling up here questions in your mind that we'll come back to at the end of this. All right, let's keep going. Verse 14, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand Nothing outside of a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. Okay, this is the parable you'll see in just a moment. And I want to just pause and say there's something going on in this text that you would have to read the whole Gospel of Mark to really fully appreciate. Now, you can read it, and you will appreciate it if you do. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus' teaching style always runs like this. Jesus gives a huge public teaching. And then he goes away and privately explains to his disciples what the public teaching was about. If you want to read more about this, read Mark chapter 4. Because in Mark chapter 4, Jesus not only does what I just said he does, but Mark even says at the end of Mark chapter 4, just before Jesus calms the storm, so we're in verses uh, 34 and following, Mark even says that Jesus, this is how Jesus taught. He taught publicly, but then privately he would explain everything to the disciples. Jesus' typical style was to tell a public parable and then to go away privately and explain the parable to the disciples. Now, that leads us to the question, what is a parable? And I just want to give you just two minutes on what a parable is. So let me offer you just a little bit of a corrective. Most of us have the Sunday school definition of a parable. And the Sunday school definition is a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And that's a fine definition. I don't want to take that away from you. But I do want to make sure that you understand that in the uh, days of the New Testament, the word parable, which is a Greek word, our, Greek, our English word parable comes from the Greek word parable, so it's just the same word. It's just sounded out in English. Instead of translated, it's sounded out in English. The Greek word parable, the word parable in the world of Jesus, was a commonly used term, and it was used just to indicate any daily or ordinary comparison. That's all it means. It doesn't have to be a story. Uh, it doesn't have to have characters in it. And so anytime you make an appeal to everyday experience in the Greek world, that was called a parable. So for example, we have, we have uh, numerous examples that, from Greek speech teachers, teachers of speech, they called, them, they called it rhetoric, and we would call them rhetoricians today. Uh, Aristotle was a teacher of speech, public speaking. He taught how to speak publicly. Aristotle gives us a very lengthy description of what a parabola is, and it's exactly what Jesus does. Uh, he just says that a parable is any illustration you draw from ordinary life. So he says, for example, uh, if you use the illustration of, um, he says, for example, that we shouldn't allow just anybody to lead the city. That's the same thing as allowing anybody to lead the army. And he says that's a parable because you're just drawing from ordinary life. Uh, Quintilian, who died about the time the book of Revelation was written, Quintilian was a master rhetorician, a teacher of public speaking. Quintil Quintil uh, Quintilian actually gives us the illustration of a farmer and seed. Quintilian says, if you want to use a good parable about learning, talk about how a farmer throws seed out and how it grows up. Well, that's exactly what Jesus does in Mark chapter 4. It's almost as though Jesus had been reading Quintilian although Quintilian wasn't born until about the time Jesus died. So the idea of a parable simply means an everyday analogy. One of the problems that we've had in reading parables is that we've come to think that a parable has to be a story, but it doesn't. Any analogy can be a parable. For example, back in Mark chapter 3, let me show you just a couple of examples. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus tells three parables that don't make it into your parable books. For some reason, we've just neglected these. We haven't noticed them. So there in Mark 3, there's another accusation against Jesus, which is that he's possessed by a devil. And Jesus gives three parables to say that can't possibly be happening right now. 
He says the first parable, verse 24 of Mark 3, a kingdom that's divided itself against itself cannot stand. That's an analogy. It's a daily da analogy. Everybody in the first century knew what it meant to have a kingdom divided against itself because they had all seen it. Herod's house had divided against itself. Israel was divided against Rome. Syria was divided against Israel. They all knew it. It's an everyday analogy. The second one is a house divided against itself cannot stand. People had seen that. They had all seen houses divided, you know, marriages that fell apart, children who hated their parents. And then the third parable that Jesus tells is that a burglar can't come in and rob you unless he first ties you up. These are all just everyday analogies. And if you think to yourself, well, I don't think of those as parables, go down to, the, uh, to chapter 4 and you'll see that Jesus actually says that he is teaching them in parables. Jesus calls these parables, and in verse 23 of chapter 3, Mark literally says the three stories I just gave you, or the three analogies I just gave you, he says these are parables. The parable of the divided kingdom, the parable of the divided house, and the parable of the burglar who ties a man up. They're all analogies. All the word parable means is a daily analogy, an analogy drawn from everyday life. So when we get to this text, Mark chapter 7, Jesus gives the analogy of going to the bathroom. And this is what he's going to say. I'll tell you what he means by it. He'll explain it himself in just a moment. What he means is, it's not what you eat that's considered dirty. Eating food's not dirty. It's what comes out of your, you know what? It's excrement that's dirty. It's what comes out of you that's dirty. So Jesus is trying to refute the Pharisees' traditions because they were saying, you have to wash your hands a certain way or you'll be dirty. And Jesus is like, no, it's not this end that's dirty. It's the other end that's dirty. It's what comes out of you that makes you unclean, not what goes into you. And by the way, let's read the text because you'll see Mark does something with this. Let's keep going. So verse 17, after he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. You see, it? Mark calls it a parable. The disciples call it a parable. Jesus calls it a parable. I didn't make it up. This is a parable. And here's what Jesus says. Are you so dull? I mean, how can you not figure this out what I'm trying to say? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them, for it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of the body, into the latrine. In saying this, Jesus declares all foods clean. So two things that are happening here. One of them is that Jesus is saying, look, it's not how you wash your cup that makes you clean or not. It's what you do with your life. It's what comes out of you. That will determine your cleanness before God. Are you following so he's undermining the tradition that says you have to wash your hand a certain way or God won't accept you. Jesus is saying, no, that is not the case. It's not the case that you have to wash your hands a certain way or only eat a certain food if you want God's acceptance. It's not what you take into you that makes you unclean. It is what comes out of you that makes you unclean. And then he goes on to explain. And this is where we get to the, the, the end of our text. Verse 20. He went on, what comes out of a person is that which defiles them. For it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual sin, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and foolishness. All these evil come from inside, and they defile a person. So Jesus is telling a parable all about the latrine to say, it's not how you wash your cups or whether or not you eat catfish. What matters is what comes out of your heart, because it is the heart that determines your cleanness before God. Out of the heart comes the sexual sins we commit. Out of the heart comes lying. Out of the heart comes greed. Out of the heart comes rage and malice and envy and hatred. So Jesus is arguing that what really matters is not that form, all that tradition stuff. What matters is how you live your life. And so the parable of the train is actually there to teach us that God is weighing the heart, not the ceremony. I want to say that again. God is there measuring the heart because out of the heart comes who we really are, not the ceremony. So now, I need to address some of the questions that I hope that I've raised for you. And I've just got a few notes here that I want to keep in front of me. So let me say this about traditions and traditionalism. I want to say, first of all, that Jesus is inviting us to scrutinize what we do to make sure that we are being obedient to the word of God and that no tradition we have is blocking us from the word of God. 
And I want to say that this is one of the big problems of traditions. Traditions start out as, here's my phrase for it, shortcuts for getting things done. You think about it. A typical tradition is established because it helps us get something done. So, for example, uh, you might have the tradition of every spring we wash our windows. Well, that's a great tradition. It's a shortcut. You now know I don't have to wash the windows in October because we're going to do it in March. It's a shortcut. Now we know we're going to get it done. The problem is that sometimes our traditions can actually get in the way of what really matters. So, for example, imagine if you uh, have someone come by and they're mowing your lawn, it's wet outside, and they sling mud all over your window. And you go to your spouse and say, we need to clean that mud off the window. And your spouse says, no, we do windows in the spring. Now you see the tradition has gotten in the way of the point. The point wasn't cleaning the window. The point was having a clean window. The point wasn't whether or not you do it in the spring. The point is making sure the windows are clear so you can see through them. And the tradition in that case got in the way of the... It's on, The only reason you wash the windows in the spring is so you have clean windows. And so sometimes our traditions get in the way of what we actually want to accomplish. Let me give you one simple church illustration. So many of the songs that we sing, and uh, I just want to say, I think music is one area that we need to be really brutal in, in asking the question, is this simply a tradition, or are we obeying the Word of God? And here's a simple illustration. I think there are deeper ones and more complex ones, and, and maybe even better ones, but I'm going to give you a simple one. I love the old hymns. I just do. But I have to admit, a lot of the old hymns no longer connect to people. In fact, a lot of the old hymns probably are so lacking in their ability to connect with people, especially people who are younger than I am, that they, can, they actually might be turning people away from Jesus. So what I consider to be a beautiful song may actually run somebody else off because they show up at church, the music sounds odd to them or weird to them. Why? Because it's not like any music they've ever heard. I mean, can you imagine if you showed up in, let's say, somewhere in West Africa and you're listening to music and it, it has no connection to the music you listen to every day? It's nothing like the music that you've heard. You probably is like, ah, I'd like to get back to the music I hear, the music of my heart. When we say that we're just going to sing the songs we've always sung, I just want you to know that might be a fine tradition where you are. But for a lot of people, that just means they're never going to connect to you. And if they're not going to connect to you, there's a decent chance they're not going to connect to Jesus. Here's even a more specific example. So a very beautiful song, in my opinion, is the song, In vain, in high and holy lays, My soul her grateful voice would praise. For who can sing the worthy praise Of the wonderful love of Jesus? It's a great song. Except... Nobody knows what it means. Here's a song that might exist, but it doesn't do anything to teach people because we don't know what it means. I just ask you, what does that song mean? Now, you, two of you are sitting there thinking, I know what it means. Okay, I just want you to know, the other hundred of you have no idea what a vain and high and holy lay means. What is it? In vain, in high, in holy lays my soul, her grateful voice would pray. We don't even know what it means. And I'm not saying you shouldn't sing the song, but I am saying it might be your tradition is no longer accomplishing its purpose. Because that song was written in order for our hearts and our minds to praise God. And now singing the song, you can't do what it was written to do because you don't know what it means. Otherwise, I'll just tell you, a lay is a poem. So here's what's being said. It would be vain. It would be per me, it, it would be pointless for me in high and holy poems to try to sing God's praise because who can really praise God? He's too big. That's what it's trying to say. So beautiful song, but the tradition of singing that song might for some people prevent them from worshiping God, literally because they can't they don't understand it. So what I'm trying to suggest is we have to be brutal in scrutinizing our traditions to ask the question. Are we doing that which will help people follow Jesus? And if a tradition is not helping people follow Jesus, we have to be subtle, perhaps, shrewd. We have to be wise. We have to be loving about it. But we need to reconsider that tradition. It might be getting in people's way. And I just want to suggest, I, I think this is an urgent message for a lot of churches of Christ. Um, so you are probably aware of the fact that now about every six or seven days, since the pandemic, it may even be worse. About every six or seven days, a Church of Christ goes out of business in America forever. 
Let that sink in. This Sunday, another Church of Christ will go out of business. The following Saturday, another Church of Christ will go out of business. The following Friday, another Church will go out of business. We're closing the doors at a rate faster than one a week. Closing their doors forever. And I can't help but think that some of that is because there's a blind allegiance to some extent to traditions that no longer accomplish the will of God. They're now in the way of the will of God. They've lingered long beyond their ability to communicate what God wants us to communicate. There's no freshness in them. And I want to say this. I want to take it one step further. Traditionalism is the religion of our dead ancestors. Well, the Christianity should be the religion of the living disciple, the living follower of Jesus. Traditionalism is a blind loyalty to dead ancestors. So I just want to remind you what Jesus says. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than they love me is not worthy of the kingdom of God. If we're just following traditions because that's the way our, our parents did it and their parents did it and whatnot, we have a blind loyalty to someone other than Jesus. So I want to suggest that traditionalism sometimes is a, it's a loyalty to a past that no longer exists. Uh, and I mean this compassionately. This is not an attack on older people. I'll be 60 years old this year, so I'm not, I'm not going after older people. I think I'm about to qualify. But I am saying, ask yourself the question that Paul asks in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is talking about uh, what he's willing to do to reach people with the gospel. And he says something very remarkable. Actually, let me just read it to you because it's a fascinating uh, strategy that Paul uses. And this is this is how Paul talks about traditions. I want you to listen to how Paul talks about traditions. So I'm right at the end of chapter 9. And Paul says, um, beginning at verse 19, he said, I'm free. I'm free. I'm not a slave to anybody. But I make myself a slave to everybody to win as many as possible. Listen to how he's thinking. He's thinking like a missionary thinks. See, if you're a missionary and you were going to a foreign country, you would ask the question, how do they communicate? What kind of music do they listen to? What do their gatherings look like? Uh, how do, what language do they speak? What, what uh, cultural cues are important to them? And you would try to speak that language because you want to reach them for Jesus. Well, Paul thinks like that at home too. And I'm encouraging you to think that way. How can you reach your neighborhood around you? That is a much more important question than the question of how can I make some guy who's never happy anyway, how can I make him happy? How can I keep him happy? That's just probably not that important a question. You just need to know people are going to get mad at you. People are going to leave your church. You're not ever going to make some people happy. Ask the question, how can I win as many as possible and pursue that? Here's how Paul continues to unfold that idea. Verse 20. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Even though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those who are under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having a law. Though I'm not free from God's law, I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. Listen to what Paul's going to do. He says, I act like I'm under a law when I'm around people with law. I act like I don't have a law when I'm around people who don't have a law. Why? Because I'm trying to win as many as I can for Jesus. Think like a missionary. Think like a missionary with your services. Think like a missionary with your programs. Think like a missionary with your life. Think like a missionary. Don't think like a museum curator whose job is just to keep every tradition somehow neatly stacked in the halls of a museum. That's not your job. Your job is to reach the world for Jesus. Make disciples of all nations, as Jesus says. Think like a missionary. Listen to Paul as he wraps that whole thing up. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. That's the opposite of traditionalism. That's not Paul saying I have no traditions, but it is Paul saying my traditions are far less important than me reaching lost people for Jesus. And it should be that way for us as well. We're trying to reach the whole world for Jesus. Those are Jesus' final words in the Gospel of Matthew. Where he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And behold, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. Jesus' last words must be our first priority. And that means a brutal assessment of traditions to assure that what we are doing is reaching all people by all possible means that are biblical for Jesus Christ. And that's the parable of the latrine. 
It's a parable that says what comes out of us will determine our cleanliness for God. Not whether you wash your hands a certain way or whether your cup is a certain way or whether your church claps or doesn't clap or has this music or that music or whatever. That's, Jesus, that, that's not the issue. The issue is what's coming out of your heart. So Landon Saunders, I want to go back to that story and I'll wrap it up. Saunders says they, uh, they had set that, you remember the story, Coca-Cola bottle on the deck, on the dock, I should say, deck, dock. He said that little catfish was flopping around and they were, um, they just felt sorry for that little guy. So somebody pulled out a pocket knife and they cut the top of that can out and they pulled the, um, pulled the lid off and they, they put it down in the water and Saunders says that little catfish swam out just a little piece, looked around as though, am I really free? And then the catfish began swimming off into the lake and as he swam away, he looked back with a tear in his eye and raised his fan and said, thank you. That's a joke. Hey guys, thanks for having me study this parable and let its life lessons sink in. It's been a privilege to be with you. You guys take care.